We've been treating neuropathy for many, many years, usually with medication management. And, but there's some patients out there that do not respond well to medications. And I had a patient the other day who unfortunately did not. What else can we offer this patient? So unfortunately, neuropathy has been in a very long-standing condition. It's, been, it's one of those chronic disorders or illnesses that are very challenging to treat. So historically, we've been able to treat neuropathy with certain types of medications. Now, neuropathy itself is, is uh, burning, numbness, tingling in the extremities. So the hands or feet that um, get super sensitive to light touch, uh, they have a chronic or constant burning, throbbing sensation. They may even have some achiness with it. Uh, and it can come from different types of uh, medical conditions. So uh, the most common form of neuropathy usually comes from diabetes. So long-standing diabetes mm, yeah. can give you something called diabetic painful neuropathy. Uh, you can also get neuropathy after chemotherapy, um, sometimes radiation therapy. And then we have um, small fiber neuropathy. Um, and then we have you know, what we call idiopathic neuropathy, which really just means we're not sure what the cause is, but it's, it is neuropathy or it's a type of nerve pain condition. So for patients who have had long-standing neuropathy, we usually start treatment with medications. And those medications could be uh, agabapentin, duloxetine or Cymbalta, pregabalin or Lyrica are probably the most, three, most common medications that we would go to as first or second line treatments for chronic neuropathy. If those don't work, and unfortunately lots of times those don't work, historically we would then say, okay, well, you know, we can um, potentially put you on an opioid of some sort to try to dull the pain and give you some better quality of life. There are a couple of different opioids that have some nerve pain um, treatment properties to them, but at the end of the day, you know, if we can avoid narcotics or opioids, we'd want to do that. And I'm happy to say that Recently, the FDA has approved spinal cord stimulation to treat uh, painful diabetic neuropathy. And this is something that we've been doing in our practice for years. Uh, it's been getting more challenging because the insurances have become more uh, specific and particular about the diagnosis for which we can use spinal cord stimulation. But you've seen those patients who um, have responded to STEM and they not only have um, life-altering changes, but they're also sometimes able to be on less pain medications yes. and they get better quality of sleep, they get, they're able to function better, and you know, their quality of life really improves. Well, with this spinal cord stimulator, how long is the recovery? Well, it's a two-step process. So the stimulator itself is a trial, and if you get 50% improvement with the trial, that's just not only pain relief, but functionality then we go to a permanent implant stage. So I equate the stimulators to pacemakers because most people are familiar with pacemakers. They're about this big, they usually get implanted underneath the skin and that's what the stimulator is like. But instead of doing any, affecting the heart, what it does is it blocks pain from going to the brain. So the FDA has approved spinal cord stimulation for a treatment of diabetic neuropathy pain and we would start with the trial, and the trial itself is done through a needle or two, and we place el electrodes with electrical contacts on them through the needle into the epidural space, and that procedure takes maybe 15 or 20 minutes to do. It's done under x-ray guidance in our office setting or a surgery center, and we tape the wires in place. And that we leave in place for about three to five days, sometimes even a week, uh, and we see how much relief people get. So there's no uh, incisions involved, there's no sutures involved, it's just a lot of tape that secures the wires in place. It is using a needle that we've used for other types of injections or spine related procedures that we've done on, on, on most of our patients who've had different types of injections in the past. So pe most people are familiar with that part of it. It is a fairly quick procedure and the nice thing about it is the patient then gets to test drive this treatment to see if it can help. And after three, five, or seven days, they come back into the office, we take the tape off, we slide the wires out, and then we ask them how much better they felt. So if I think I'm a good candidate for this, can you take me through the process from how do I get diagnosed to how do I get the recommendation to have this and then what takes to move forward with this? Sure. So the first part would be to come in and be seen by a physician or a provider, uh, whether that's in our practice or your primary care doctor's office or your neurologist's office. Or endocrinologist, 
uh, we're really looking for someone to evaluate and make that decision on whether or not this is the condition that is the problem. So if you have a diagnosis of neuropathy, well then right off the bat, this is an option for you. However, if, if what I'm describing sounds like these are the symptoms that you may be having, then it's probably best for you to see a provider to get evaluated and to get an assessment to see if neuropathy is in the differential of what you could potentially have. An EMG nerve conduction study test is a test, a needle test that can uh, help us identify if you have the diagnosis, but it's not always necessary to make that diagnosis. So it means that we don't necessarily have to have an EMG or nerve conduction test to be diagnosed with neuropathy. We can make that diagnosis uh, by basing um, through clinical or an overview of by, by well, we can make that diagnosis for neuropathy based on your history and what you're, what you're describing and how it feels. So once you get the diagnosis, then you come in, we, you talk to us, then we can start the authorization process if you've exhausted the conservative treatments, which would be the medications. So if the medications haven't helped, then the next step is to get an authorization, which we would have to submit the paperwork to the insurance. That could take anywhere from a week to a month to get approval. Then we get you scheduled, which, which um, can get scheduling pretty quickly. Uh, the trial itself is about 20 minutes long. The procedure itself is 20 minutes long. And then we bring you back in about three, five, or seven days later to have the, the wires removed. If you respond to the trial, then we send you to a surgeon to get evaluated for the permanent implant. And that permanent implant surgical procedure is an outpatient procedure. You go home the same day. It usually takes a surgeon. An implant surgical procedure is an outpatient procedure. You go home the same day. It usually takes a surgeon about 45 minutes to an hour to implant the device. And they'll see you back two weeks later for a post-operative visit. And then you'll continue to see us and we will help manage the device, which may need some reprogramming, which doesn't hurt. It's all done through Bluetooth technology. And uh, the reprogramming itself is painless and can help keep the devices updated. Well, I would say we've been doing pain management for a long time, and I think that we've seen a lot of patients who have benefited very well by this. Um, on a personal level, you, you know that uh, I've had a couple family members and friends that have gone through this and have successfully had a uh, stimulator you know, implanted and still doing well. So I think that one of the key components is having the patients really, really understand that this is not just a one and done, you know, this is this treatment in addition to is not so much in lieu of. So therefore, it's not like you're gonna be done and then we're going to just turn our back on you. You're still gonna be our patient. There's, they still see us on a regular basis. And in fact, you saw one just the other day and how many times did she tell you that her quality of life is just, she's 70 years old and can get on the floor with her grandbaby, can get up. Yep. That's profound. And, and I think part of the issue is that people don't know that this even exists or they may be worried about whether or not they're a good candidate for it or if, if they're too old or if they're too sick or if they're too young to warrant talking about this. So I would say it's very easy for us to discuss this. Um, go out to find your providers, discuss this with your providers because this could be something that can be life altering. Thank you. Hello. Um, does anyone have any questions about um, neuropathy or spinal cord stimulation to treat neuropathy? Please let us know. Uh, question Can spinal cord stimulation treatment be combined with medications? Y yes. Uh, the goal with uh, spinal cord stimulation is to try to improve your overall functionality and um, 
we want to do that with uh, any way we can. Um, ideally, if uh, the stimulation is, is therapeutic, it's, it's helping, your pain's better controlled, you're uh, more functional, then perhaps you can get away with less medication, but um, we can definitely combine medications and stimulation uh, without any issues. Uh, does insurance cover this procedure for idiopathic neuropathy? So uh, currently the uh, diagnosis that has most recently been approved is uh, diabetic painful neuropathy. Um, we have been using spinal cord stimulation to treat patients with neuropathy for years now. Uh, sometimes it does become a challenge uh, for specific uh, idiopathic neuropathy, which is uh, basically neuropathy of unknown, um, of no, unknown um, cause. Uh, we would have to see if, uh, depending on specific insurance policy, but we do believe we can get it approved. How quickly can the trial for SCS be scheduled? Uh, actually, the, 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 the trial process, uh, the process in general is, if this is something you're interested in, uh, we, talked, we talked to you about it, uh, and then we start the authorization process. And depending on the insurance, most insurances nowadays require a psychiatric evaluation. Uh, it's really just to make sure that you have reasonable expectations. Uh, that evaluation can take anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes. If you don't have a, um, a psych provider, we can help you with that. We have our own in-house providers that can do a quick consultation and submit. Uh, we need that to be able to submit for authorization. The authorization process can take anywhere from a week or two. Uh, and then once we get the authorization back from insurance, we can get you scheduled right away. So the whole process could take a couple of weeks. I had a stimulator many years ago. I've been told the tingling feeling I had going down both legs isn't as bad as years ago. So the question was, um, the older generation spinal cord stimulators had a tingling sensation uh, that you'd feel all the time. And in the last five years, the technology has changed where you no longer have to feel that tingling. The devices are able to be programmed with tingling and without. Um, I think most people nowadays prefer without, but some people do like to have the tingling to be able to feel where their stimulation is. Uh, and uh, yes, so nowadays the, the device blocks the pain signals from going to the brain, but you don't feel any tingling at all. Have you done this procedure for anyone in their 80s on a blood thinner? Yes, we have. We have, um, we'd have to coordinate stopping the blood thinner for a certain amount of time, depending on what specific blood thinner that is with the prescribing physician, whether that's your cardiologist or primary care physician, we want to make sure that it's safe for you to be able to be off blood thinner. Uh, and, um, and a lot of this and everything in medicine is balancing risks and benefits. So we want to make sure we're balancing that properly. Uh, we, we get clearance to hold the blood thinner for the appropriate amount of time to safely do the procedure. And we want to, we would probably minimize the amount of time that the, the trial is actually occurs uh, just so that we can get you back on the blood thinner sooner than later. Uh, but we have done uh, this procedure on patients in their 80s, actually in their 90s as well. Um, I don't think age is a, uh, is a factor in who is an appropriate candidate and who this could help. Uh, so if it's something you're interested in, you know, we definitely are here to help and to talk about it. question here.
additional questions? All right, well, if you have any other additional questions, feel free to um, give us a call or contact us and uh, we can discuss at your next available appointment. Um, we're happy to continue to educate and continue to discuss this in the offices as well. Um, hope everyone has a great weekend and thank you for uh, joining us.